Welcome back to the Wolverine.com podcast. I'm John Borton. We're talking with our usual Tuesday guest throughout the winter, Tom Crawford, our man in East Lansing, the uh, the guy that brings it all to you from behind enemy lines, really. But uh, he holds forth for uh, for Michigan up there. Tom, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, it's great to be back. And, and when the football team's uh, Big Ten champions and uh, headed to the CFP, uh, whatever the basketball team does is I love basketball as much as football. I just, it's just easier to accept because I'm in such a freaking good mood from what happened in Indianapolis, you know, what, nine days ago, nine or 10 days ago. So you can't get me in a bad mood today, despite the basketball team, JB. There you go. Well, I think you have a lot of company in that respect, but we are going to start out with basketball because that's the most recent event. And then we'll week, uh, work, work our way towards uh a little bit happier news with with football because right now basketball is uh in the doldrums and back into that uh you know we we talked about the whipsaw of emotions with this team and the latest issue was not good you were there i was there minnesota at michigan and it almost felt like the crowd that night reflected the team because it was dead in there and there wasn't the – they weren't on edge. They weren't on go. It wasn't uh, the big anticipation. It felt like, okay, what's going to happen here? It almost feels like this team is, okay, what's going to happen here? Yeah, you know, I got in discussion with a, pe- a few people about that crowd, and some were saying, hey, they got to show us. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll cheer for They got to show it, get us something excited. No, it's your responsibility. The toughest venues in college basketball are crowds – that spur their team on in need, not a show me crowd, which Michigan typically has been in football and basketball for decades. Okay. This was the ultimate show me crowd. My God, you, this crowd should have been up from, from, from the moment they came out on the floor. It was a late arriving crowd and I'm not pinning it all in the crowd, but I'm going to say, I, I'm glad you served it up that way. And when there was some, that, that defense needed to be spurred on. They didn't They didn't show up, the crowd, until Michigan went in that 10-0 late in the game when they, after they'd been down 16. I was extremely disappointed in that crowd because this team needed them, and that's what a home court advantage. And Chrysler looked like 2001 or 2002 all over again uh, in the Tommy Amaker era. I was very disappointed. But back to back to what we saw, I've never seen a game like this John, where you had so much dribble drive penetration when you had a team have a 16 point lead with one or two assists at that time. That's nuts. That's nuts. That that defensive side of the court was was horrible. They took uh, a few steps back after that win over Nebraska. Yeah, I mean, it was just it ended up with two assists blow by after blow by yeah, blow by no, blow no. by blow by. Yep. Yeah, no help underneath. You're not getting. Uh, I, you can sense the frustration in in an Eli Brooks because he knows what it's supposed to look like. He knows how that defense is supposed to look. He knows how the level of toughness and grit is supposed to be. Uh, you know, I just got done talking with with Doug Skeen about how, the point in which he saw Michigan's grit really come forth on the football side he said once they got it done in penn state after the other venues they would played in he said okay i I realize this was a team with some grit and with some spine i think it may be that that is a learned characteristic in some ways at this level and i think this is a basketball team that has to learn it pretty quickly and and not only learn the uh the the attitudinal element of grit, but also how you get there and the the functional ways in which you help teammates out on defense. Yeah, this is where Isaiah Livers was such a great orchestra leader on help defense, in particular on on uh, on, on defending transition defense, which really didn't apply to Minnesota. It's not like they were pushing the ball; they were just going down half court and just okay, I'm going to drive on you. Um, I thought uh, Devontae Jones actually, and everybody picks on him, and I get that he is not Mike Smith. Let's be real, uh, but and 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 you know he, but but he did some good things. He did he he truly did some good things. Um, Caleb Houston came out really well against Nebraska. 
um, which is not a very good team, even though they took NC State into four overtimes, which took Purdue into uh, an overtime. Um, that, that, that Nebraska not very good. And so maybe that was a little fool's goal with him that he was coming back. And then Brandon Johns, um, Matt, my God, he was terrific against Nebraska. And then what happens this week? He doesn't get a lot of PT. Um, he doesn't get any rebound. You know, he just he can't defend in this particular game. And um, I, he doesn't score. He didn't even take a shot. I mean, and he didn't get a lot of minutes. I, I, you know, I think he got like 12 or 13. Um, this was a strange game, a, 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 a bad slash strange game in so many ways. And Musa Diabate, we didn't think he was coming back. Oh, he's coming back. That's great. And he does rebound and, and such. Um, but my God, um, with the two bigs in there, against quick teams in a bit. I don't think the too big thing is going to work out because two, the, the, the Big Ten teams and other good teams are too quick, um, and it's not a good match. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? When you see that those two bigs in there, I'm just thinking this doesn't work offensively, and it doesn't work defensively. Yeah, I, I, I'm not opposed to two bigs as long as they're Juwan Howard and Chris Weber. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't. I I like the idea of having uh, a couple of guys that big out there, but it does hurt you in some ways. Now, once in a while, you'll see Diabate cover up and uh, and come down and swat away a shot after one of those blow bys. But overall, I think I, I, I'm not uh, I'm not completely comfortable with it. At least until he he grows in some ways. It, it they could come to the point where those two guys could uh, could get along and and play well together but I I I agree with you I don't think it's working right now but I don't think I I think several things aren't working right now it's it's one of those situations where uh, you you try to gauge all right how much did we overestimate the uh the the Mike Smith to Devontae oh, yeah. Jones transition and it and yeah. you know that was cast as well Devontae Jones is going to be an upgrade okay yeah. uh, you're not you're not seeing that you're also well sure you lost uh, Wagner and Livers and but you got this this top five top three class in the country coming in well you know. There's there are top five classes and top five classes. They're not all uh, packaged and ready to go right away. We've seen some signs from Caleb Houston, certainly signs from Diabate, but you know they're they're not coming in as uh, as a couple of Fab Five members. No, and the and the glaring stat three of eighteen from three point land. I mean they don't. I mean Duncan Robinson is not walking through the tunnel. And you know, not back to Eli, who I think is the core leader of this team. Let's let's be honest. He's the leader of this team. And you and I have been covering this dude for five years now. I mean, he's a fifth year guy, right? I mean, this is his fifth year. Yeah, four three. Yeah, four years of actual play. I mean, at least solid three years of going into that post game presser. We were we got to talk to him, right? I've never seen him so pissed off, for lack of a better term. I mean, at first of all, he was disgruntled. Then he got, then he in a conversation, he, he, you could tell he was getting mad. And that's a good thing. And he kept going back to the fact we're not physical enough. Physical. You heard it. He, 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 he referenced, though, we're not a bunch, this is not high school ball. And so I think he was really irritated with his team. And then on the other end of the room, we had in our scrum, we're back to our little kind of scrums. Hunter Dickinson was, was just, uh, you know, he just looked like, not you know he just like he was disengaged i mean i don't know i mean someone has got to step up and be a leader i'm not saying you need an aiden hutchinson caliber leader in basketball for michigan basketball but it wouldn't hurt because someone needs to grab somebody by the jersey you know and just let let's go let's go you know and not getting it done and this team looks lost out there against an average minnesota team Ben Johnson is going to be a good coach, mind you. and But they got waxed by Michigan State. And Jameson Battle, I've been told by a coach, is going to be an NBA player. And he was terrific. I get that. But this is not a very deep Minnesota team. My, my God, they got five guys, literally, maybe six. Michigan's so much deeper. And bad, bad loss Saturday night at Chrysler. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah, no doubt. We, you saw Michigan State take them down and take them down fairly comfortably in their own place up there uh, at uh, at the barn 
And uh, but you also then saw saw Michigan just not being able to to give them a serious challenge and claw back into that thing after they fall behind. I see Hunter Dickinson right now as uh, very very frustrated because yeah. he saw the way he'd like it to look last year. Now I don't think he quite knows what to do about this because. Um, he had so many great complimentary pieces last year that he was able to operate. He was new to everybody. Now yeah. people are, are on to him. He's got less uh, to, uh, to surround himself with, and he's more frustrated. Eli, you said, uh, was, was angry, and I think that's a good, uh, good summation there. He's, uh, you got to remember, here's Eli Brooks was, what, your fourth option last year? Yeah. And so his threes were more open. His uh, his attention on him uh, certainly was less than it is now. And now he's he and Dickinson, if they don't get it done, who's going to? Now, there are guys that have the talent to do it, but nobody that's coming with it consistently. I think that's going to grow. I think it's going to grow through Caleb Houston and some of these other young guys. But at this point, it's it's kind of like uh, we got to figure this out in a hurry. Yeah, you're right. And, and I don't know if, you know, I don't know Eli that well other than talking to him, you know, and that with others. Uh, I mean, I don't know what, how, what kind of a, you know, you know, kind of uh, stealing the spine, you know, getting your face kind of guy he is in terms of leadership. And there is a lot of terrific different styles of leadership. Mind you, you don't have to be that guy that gets in everybody's grill. But someone needs to step up on that team uh, to do that. And, and it's got to be he or Hunter. I mean, those are the leaders of the team. Or, or Brandon Johns could play that role. He could. I mean, um, but he needs to he needs to work, look at his self -con self confidence DNA a little bit because it seemingly goes. And this is just outside looking in, but it, it seems to be going away. Um, and, and then he doesn't get any opportunity. Uh, you know, Zeb Jackson played a lot of minutes and uh, he didn't play in this game. I don't know the mechanics or, or, or decision-making that Juwan has in the staff. Um, I, and I don't know if they should need to go, you know, Jim Beheim and play zone because we can't guard anybody and maybe go that route. <laughs> I mean, I thought about – it actually worked lat latter part of that game. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it, this, is a, this is a team that's going to have to figure that out. They got a couple winnable games, let's call it, a nice way to say cupcakes, coming up with, with the Southern Utah and uh, – Purdue, Fort Wayne, or whatever they call that school on uh, next Tuesday night. Uh, but they got to fine tune this thing and they got to go to sent down Central Florida. And then they got Rutgers on the road, Michigan State at home, Purdue at home, and Illinois on the road. And they could, you know, they could, this could be, they could just, you know, carve themselves right out of this race or out of even NC2A contention, uh, uh, tournament contention, if they don't get the rack together and grab some of these wins when they need them. There's no doubt. And I will say this. Uh, I, I agree that you are in a, uh, a tough situation this year. You either get a lot better quickly or it could be somewhat of a lost season. Uh, but what I will not buy into at all is this notion that, yeah, okay, well, now a lot of uh, John B. Lines guys are gone. And, uh, you know, it's. No, I don't, this I don't agree with that. Yeah. I, I, you hear that little bit of rumble and you, you think, no, come on. This staff and Juwan Howard proved what he could do with a, uh, a very talented roster last year. I think now, you know, the decisions that they made on personnel in the offseason at point guard, okay, they may be caught a little bit short this year. And also, uh, they, they brought in a very, very talented class, but that doesn't mean they are instantly what you need them to be. I think this staff has a big job of, of pulling things together, but uh, they have certainly shown that they can maintain a great culture and, uh, and, and coach. So I, I, don't, I don't buy into any of those sort of little uh, murmuring background worries as, as much as I just recognize, okay, this is a situation where uh, they've got some work to do, and and you know, in order to, it, the, the hopes were built up so high last year. Okay, 
this is just going to be a seamless transition. Yes, we're losing uh, some guys to the NBA, but it's just going to be a reload situation. Well, this reload, uh, you know, initially is including some blanks. Yeah, you framed that incredibly well, John. I commend you for that. <laughs> you said it all. I mean, that's that's the issue. But who's going to be that guy in the backcourt? That I mean, so if Devontae Jones is not the solution, and sometimes when I look at his shot, it looks bad right off release. You, I mean, you can tell it's not going in. Who's going to be that guy? Now, the guy that I that has these little moments, if you will, the kid out of Las Vegas, Frankie Collins, number ten. That guy, I think, could be the guy. I'm not saying he's going to be Derek Walton, but he could be the guy. Someone in the someone in the backcourt between him and Zeb Jackson, someone is going to have to step up to compliment Eli and and to be able to feed the beast in terms of Hunter Dickinson, get you know great entry passes and and dribble dive penetrate Xavier Simpson and with a you know with a little dish. And I saw uh, there's a couple of them that were like wow there that now do that every time down down the court, um, and that's going to take time and. And maybe this is a 2014. You know what I mean? Maybe it might be. And it's not a negative reflection on Juwan Howard because I agree with you, John. There's there there's uh the the, the vacancies and in, in, including Franz Wagner of what he brought to the table. Maybe not in the UCLA game, but throughout the season, that's a huge void when you combine it. And Shawnee Brown brought that three ball in there with that leap off the floor, and he would be a streak shooter. Who is the streak three baller on this team who can catch fire and hit two or three in a row to flip the script on a game? We don't have that guy. The guy doesn't exist, and it's gonna. But he's gonna have to emerge from somewhere on that roster. Yeah, let me give you a. a, a let me agree with you on Frankie Collins, and and give you a little bit of a an old time <laughs> <Pump> throwback. <the> <laughs> well, okay. no, what I'm what I'm saying is when I see him a couple years down the road. Uh, I, I, I could see a, a little bit, a little hints of, of Ricky green and, yeah, um, there you go. the way he moves out there and the way it, the, the tempo just changes, but understand Ricky green for, uh, all you longtime Michigan basketball watchers had two years of college basketball under his That's belt true. before That's he true. took over at Michigan. This is, th these are things that Frankie Collins has to learn. He has to learn how to operate better in ball screen situations. He's got to make the free throws, uh, just spend yeah. forever at the line on your own time, getting that done. And, and to, sh you know, his shooting has to come along, but I love how he moves out there. I think he could be a real uh, leader and asset to this team, but he's not there yet. So it, like, like so much, so many other elements of this team, it is how quickly they get better and uh and just doing it this uh it's got to start on the defensive end in my mind but the shooting also has to pick up yeah no you're right and, and terrence williams another one of those head scratchers who can my god he had 22 points the other okay i gotta keep qualifying it. it was nebraska i can't you know maybe it, maybe it was the fact they were playing nebraska i don't know but man i mean i'm 102 67 i mean come on john when you when you said hey, that was what tuesday night I don't know if we were chatting about that game or not. I think we did the next, whatever. Or we chatted in the in the press room the other day. They looked really good. They looked really good. And I'm, we're talking to when we're sitting down with Brendan Quinn, and I asked him, where, where, you know, where's this team at? You know, and he said, well, you know, they, this is this is a, they're trending up. But if they drop this one today, they're heading back down the other direction. I mean, this was a mm -hmm. pivotal pivotal game for Michigan. It's Big Ten. It's a winnable game at home against a team that was picked 13th in the Big Ten. So there is justification for people who follow Michigan media-wise and are fans that they're looking at this team and thinking, wow, how did you go from that to that? Or even just look the way you do against Arizona, against Carolina. I mean, Seton Hall, a game they should have won at home. I mean, let me count the ways that Michigan fans should be worried. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, before I let you go, though, flip side of that, uh, Michigan fans are sitting on top of the world with football. I recall Lloyd Carr saying often, and he said this to his team, look, if we win, 
there's enough for everybody. And you're seeing that right now. Aiden Hutchinson, second in the Heisman voting, Big Ten MVP. You got Josh Gaddis as uh, as the Broyles Award winner. And you could have had, uh, like like Josh Gaddis said in his acceptance uh, or, or his speech before the, the, the Broyles folks, he said uh, Mike McDonald just could as easily could be here. You see all the representation on the all Big Ten teams. This this crew is just kind of living and celebrating the dream. They're not celebrating in the sense that they think it's over, but I, I think they're they're garnering a lot of well deserved attention right now, and at the same time have to kind of put that away and and get ready for Georgia. Yeah, it's funny you referenced Lloyd Carr because I thought about Lloyd Carr after the Michigan State game on October 30th. Remember when Lloyd Carr midseason or maybe even a couple, you know, maybe a few games left and Michigan would drop one. His 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 mantra was there's a lot of football to be played. You say that over and over and over. And I thought about that after the state game. There was a lot of football to be played, including that crucial win that you were talking about with Karsh about at Penn State. That was huge. And then the Ohio State game, and then obviously what we saw down in Indianapolis against Iowa. So, you know, he was a pretty good coach, that Lloyd Carr was. And 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 he was very profound in a lot of his statements and about the rewards will come when you win. And they're certainly coming in for Michigan. I just wish they they were such a hot team after Indiana or after the Indianapolis uh, visit down there when beating Iowa. I thought, man, I wish they wish they played the CFP right now. So now we have this three and a half week thing. I know everybody else does, but Michigan was was a red hot team and uh, I was ready to go right now as a fan, at least. There you go. Well, you got to hope that they can pick it up on New Year's Eve. We'll be following that. We'll be talking all about it along with Michigan basketball and its recovery efforts after a bad loss against Minnesota. Tom Crawford, always great to have you. We'll uh, talk again next week. Look forward to it, John. Always great to be on the Wolverine podcast.